Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, I was a little bit late back there. So um, welcome to the creative stage and welcome to Web Summit. Did you guys go out last night? Did you go to Night Summit? I did. And I met a lot of people and I talked and talked. So my voice is a little bit scratchy this morning, but it was totally worth it. So if you can just put up with that for a little bit, it'll be a, an easy day. I'm going to power through. So I'm going to be your MC for this morning for the creative stage. And I'm really excited to be here because this stage is all about creativity and storytelling. And we're going to have some of the create, most creative minds in the industry on stage here to inspire you and hopefully fuel some ideas for your creativity in the future. Now, I am a storyteller. I love storytelling. It's my day job. I'm a speechwriter for executives, and um, I've written for President Obama, who was a great storyteller on his own. He really didn't need me, so I felt like that was a, a, a waste of my time because <laughs> he knew what to say. Um, on, on, on my uh, personal time, I spend time on the NPR Moth Storytelling Hour. If you've ever heard that story in the United States, it's on NPR Radio Hour. And one of our other speakers um, on Thursday is from the producer of The Moth. So if you want to hear more about storytelling, you can go see her speak on Thursday. So today, we are going to have a great lineup for you. We have um, Google, we have the New York Times, we have Fast Company, we have some of the greatest minds coming in here to talk to you tonight. So I'm, I'm going to get on with the day. And let me ask you, how many of you have heard the expression, the power of persuasion? Oh, good lot of you. How many of you um, don't speak English as a first language? And you still know that phrase <laughs> because it's it's true. Persuasion is powerful. And no one knows that better than our first speaker. He is the international creative director for the New York Times. And you should listen up because he's going to tell us why we are sometimes so easily persuaded. So um, please welcome to the stage, Graham McDonald. Hi guys, thanks for coming this morning. Um, I'm Graham McDonald, Creative Director for the New York Times. Uh, I look after uh, a lot of our branded content and native advertising over at the studio in New York. Uh, and this is my dad. So my dad's 82 years old. He's fitter than me, he can run faster than me easily. But I guess like, like most people our age, he doesn't have a clue what I do for a living, right? So he's like, you know, uh, you work for the New York Times, I guess you're, you're a journalist. So I'm like, well, you know, I guess like I tell stories, um, but it's a bit more on the creative side, you know, like design. And so he's like, oh, so you must design the paper then. I'm like, mm, no, I mean, we do a lot of print work, but my work is mainly in the online sort of interactive experience, a lot more sort of technical. And he's like, oh, I get it now. Okay, so you, so you make the website. I'm like, mm, not exactly. So I thought, fair enough, you can't really sum up this role in kind of, you know, one image, but I thought it isn't quite black and white. Um, it, I wondered if there was one image that I could show my dad that sort of summed up what I did for a living. So I, then I found this one. So, you know, as much as I'd like to think of myself as a sort of international man of mystery, what I'm actually talking about is this. So product placement. And when you, when you think about it, branded content is almost like product placement for journalism. The same way that Aston Martin reaped the benefits when James Bond drives one of their cars, the same thing can happen to a brand when they're closely aligned with a, a trusted publisher such as ours. Um, and there's a common um, theme that runs through branded content. Um, there's a really good quote here from, from Craig Davis, who is the CCO of uh, J. Walter Thompson. We need to stop interrupting what people are interested in and be what people are interested in. 
Um, the problem is the market's completely saturated with ads. I was in a, a conference in New York recently and someone said, if ads were quotes from the Bible, it'd be considered theological brainwashing, which is pretty crazy. And it's really, it's really sort of trendy to think of, or to call yourself sort of a disruptor at the minute, but how frustrating is it to be disrupted? You know, people's capacity for bullshit is, is diminishing by the second. Um, our willingness to be incon inconceived or interrupted or insulted is getting really, really low. And as human beings, we, we're naturally uh, put in the position of trying to maximize our signal to noise ratio. Um, so in the perfect world, branded content is content that looks like, sounds like, and sits alongside the native content of a publisher, except a brand has paid the publisher to make sure the content promotes their, their product. And obviously this is a, a very simplified view of it, but this is kind of what it is in a nutshell. When it's done properly, branded content should be indistinguishable from the native content that it sits around. So it's really important that it has the same quality, the same tone, same standards that the audience have come to expect. Now, a lot of clients come to us saying, you know, we want video or we want VR. And we kind of go back to them with the same answer every time. And we say, it's really important to figure out the story first and then how to tell it afterwards. The idea should inform the format and not the other way around. And even in the word storytelling itself, the word story comes before the telling part. And everyone loves a good story, right? It's built into our DNA and you can trace it all the way back to sort of cave paintings and hieroglyphics because storytelling is a vital tool for us as humans to pass on information. You know, it's the reason why we've evolved into the, the, the um, peak species of the, of the planet. And research has shown that the chemical makeup of your brain actually changes when you're engaged with a story. And it can cause you to develop thoughts and opinions and ideas that align with the person actually telling it. And that's because the brain, without going into too much science about it, but it, it generates two main hormones when you're engaged with the story. The first one is cortisol. And this um, brings, is, is generated when uh, the sort of tense moments of the story, which it, uh, brings us into focus. And the second one is oxytocin, which is the kind of the feel good chemical that promotes uh, connection and empathy. Um, and also happy endings also trigger the limbic system, which is like the reward center. So when a, a story has a happy ending, this is like a reward for us as humans. They did a, an experiment not long ago where they asked people to donate after they'd been engaged with a story like this. And the vast differences in how much more people donated when they'd been engaged with a good story was huge. Um, now, a while back, I was on the train and I came across uh, an article. This is London Bridge is Down. So that's the code word that the Secret Service used if the Queen of England was ever to pass away. And it sort of detailed the, the, the next three months of what happens there. So I started reading and then this happened. Keeps going, keeps going. And, and you know, this might have taken eight or 9,000 words, words to tell this story. Um, but I thought, this, this, you know, there could have been a better way to tell this. And I was a captive audience. I was on this train for three hours, but the investment I was willing to give to this piece was not uh, worth the reward that I was going to get out of it. Um, and getting attention isn't that difficult, but sustaining it is. Um, and it did the hard part. I was already bought in. I, you know, I wanted to read this story, but it was just too much to consume. Um, just touching on what was going on, uh, just what I was talking about a second ago, you've got this balance, this investment versus payoff scale, right? People are really good at uh, gauging um, if the payoff is worth the amount of effort they have to put in. And a while back at the New York Times, we used to do these huge interactive stories that were really data-driven, um, had, you know, you could interact with them, you could filter them, they had tooltip sliders. But what we thought, found is that it's, other than scroll, it's actually really hard to get people to interact with anything. In fact, if you want to make the reader click or hover or do anything other than scroll, the reward has to be big for that. Um, when information is cheap, attention becomes expensive. Oh, I love this quote. It's because, like I say, getting attention is not that difficult, but sustaining it is. Um, there was a quote a while back that said something along the lines of, there's no such thing as an attention span, only the quality of what you're consuming. And like I said, the mobile uh, article I, I showed you earlier did the hard part, um, but I wasn't willing to invest my time into that. Um, but how can you combat this? So there are millions of design theories, and we could go really in depth into sort of color theory, um, you know, persuasive um, techniques. 
Uh, we've got huge data teams in the New York Times that are dedicated, and they sort of look at how big buttons should be, how, like, how big headlines should be, how many characters it should be. Um, you, we could do a whole syllabus on it just you know, over the course of a year, but um, I'm just going to take you through a couple of the main learnings that we've found that can help increase engagement. So the first one is obvious, right? Make it visual. Um, regardless of the content of the ad, how the content is structured plays a huge part in its success. Um, and again, if we go back to the sort of investment payoff scale that we looked at earlier, we see content as a much smaller co uh, cognitive lift if it's presented in small digest uh, digestible ch chunks. Um, I'm trying really hard not to say the word snackable at the minute because I think that's just been overused quite a lot. Uh, but there are huge amounts of research to back this up. You know, visuals are processed 60,000 times faster than words. Uh, pages with visuals draw 94% more views on average. Um, but still, you can just replace it with visuals. You know, sometimes huge portions of the text can just be replaced with one, one image. Um, this was uh, a piece that the newsroom ran recently was about when Apple hit their one trillion valuation. And we could have ran a really, really interesting article about um, what, how that worked and you know, how, what the, the actual scale of it. But telling it in a much more visual way was much more engaging. The power of visuals really help make complicated subjects easy to understand. And they can communicate scale in a way that words just can't. The second thing that we usually look at is to make it move. And obviously, that example there um, was a good example of that. And simply put, movement attracts attention. It's as simple as that. You know, Our minds are engineered to highlight the differences in our visual field. So if we go way back to sort of caveman times, we constantly needed to scan the horizons to spot if anything has changed. You know, If there's a, a predator or something, we can actually um, eat ourselves and enemies, anything like that. So making it move can make a huge difference. Um, if we take something like this, for example, so the octopus in this shot doesn't want to be seen. But as soon as there is a change in the visual field, if there's a movement or contrast, um, it, our attention is immediately drawn there, no matter what our attention was on before. And aside from getting the attention, movement can also be a good way to distract the user from things you don't want them to experience. So a good, experience, uh, a good example of that is things like loading times. You know, if, if you're having to make a user wait, Look at this little animation to keep you busy so you're not uh, focused on uh, how long you're actually there for. Um, so when I was looking for quotes for this presentation and looking for inspiration, um, one of the main huge in, in inspirations to my life, and I think pretty much everyone in the world, um, Jeff Goldblum, obviously, he said, well, you were so preoccupied with whether or not you could, you didn't stop to think if you should. So it's really tempting to apply all these latest bells and whistles and it's you know all these easy gimmick points to use the latest tech but overdoing it can actually hurt you know animation should be treated more as a a, a tool rather than polish um, you don't want it to turn into a sort of 90s powerpoint you know um, they should be used to guide the users through the experience and not be the experience itself um, if everything is shouting for your attention then nothing is going to get it in the end Encourage interaction. So the third thing we can do is introduce gamification. And again, this is kind of a buzzword of the last few years, but humans are competitive by nature. You know, gamification triggers that dop dopamine rush in the end. It's you know, leveling up, getting these rewards, um, getting feedback or achieving something all gives you that little rush. And uh, it all depends on how, um, whether or not you can hit this goal. And sometimes more literally than others. You know, this is uh, a trick um, people used to put into um, toilets around the world to, just to stop people peeing on the floor and you just get them to, to um, take part in one of these goals um, really, really helps them focus. So the, the thing is whether or not a person takes a challenge comes down to three things. The first thing is motivation. What do they get out of it? Are they encouraged to perform uh, an action? What encourages them? Uh, the second thing is ability. Do they think uh, or do they perceive themselves as being able to complete this goal? And the third thing is triggers, right? So these, this is things like cues, signals that encourage them to take action. Um, an example, a really, really quick example of, of one with, we ran on a program for Philips is you can see um, the little interactive feature on the right. Now, we could have really easily just put that up as a quote. And the idea is that you sort of hover over it and you scrub the tooth. It's all about oral health and keeping your mouth healthy. Um, we could have really easily just put that on, but 
creating that small little gamification, that small little reward. And again, if we look at the, the three factors earlier, the motivation, so not only do they get the facts, they get that little dopamine hit of completing the task. Ability is relatively easy to achieve. All you do have to, is have to move your mouse over it. And the trigger was the cursor change when you went over the, the interaction section. So they knew what they had to do. The third thing, uh, sorry, the final thing is to make it obvious. And now this might seem obvious, but it, this, this is the one that usually uh, is one that most people overlook. So this is guiding people through the user experience and giving a clear indication of what you have to do. Um, there's an old saying that says, you know, user experience design is like a good joke. If you have to explain it, then it's not that good in the first place, right? So it's not about explaining the user experience, it's about making it instinctive enough that they just know. And one little uh, rule that we use in, in the studio is to create a labyrinth rather than a maze. So when you look at a maze, there's loads of different options. You can go down certain different routes, some are dead ends, sometimes you have to go back to get to where you were. Um, and it's, you know, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made about how you are gonna experience that particular um, route. Whereas a labyrinth might be just as long, it might have just the, amount, the exact same amount of paths, but there's one guided route all the way around. You don't even have to think about how you're gonna experience, you just do it uh, instinctively. The other thing with um, persuasive design is not always about the visuals. So how the content, uh, how, the, how the, the copy is structured plays a huge part too. So um, I'm just going to share a couple of examples of some, some newsroom uh, headlines and how we change them to increase engagement. So the first one is the six questions, right? So this is who, what, when, where, how, and why. Um, here's an example for Parkland students, social media savvy took time. But when we replaced that with a question, we saw a huge lift in the amount of click-through rates that, that, that the, the headline got from that. The second one is clarity. And again, this might sound obvious, but when you look at a, a headline like this, um, being crystal clear about what the content will um, house is really, really, really important. So when you changed it to something like this, you saw another huge lift. Numbers can be a big draw. So when we look at a headline like this and replaced it with actual figures in the headline itself, we saw a 250% rise on the amount of click-through rate just from that one headline. And the final thing is the promise of an explanation. If you tease what the reader might be able to take away, it can be a big draw. So this is an example of a headline. And then when we teased uh, an explanation of what you would get out of that, again, you saw a huge lift in the amount of um, click-throughs that the, the, that particular headline got. So when you think about it, Everyone, it's really, really common to hear the phrase content is king. But if that's true, then design must be the castle, right? You could have the best content in the world, but it's no good if what it's housed in isn't up to, up to scratch. Now, I'm not saying VR is bad or never do animation. What I'm saying is the magic combination of a good story executed in the right way is the experience everyone should be aiming for. Do what's right for the story and then do it well. So you might be thinking, right, okay, like we've got all of these guidelines, we've got all of these best practices, we kind of know now what we're supposed to do. And you think, right, we're leveled up, we've got all of these powers. There are a few ways you can actually hurt your engagement if you use them in the wrong way. And the first is by intentionally going against it. You know, storytellers sometimes can be so desperate to stand out from the crowd, they sacrifice the prior learnings just to be different. And you can draw a pretty good analogy between this kind of online design and the car industry. So car companies used to spend millions and millions designing their cars. But when you think about it, the design of a car hasn't really changed much in the past 100 years. So improvements have been made over the decades, but the main design has mostly stayed the same. They're all mostly the same shape. They all have four wheels. They all use a wheel to steer, etc. And why is that? And it's because well, it, it works. That's as simple as that. You know, we figured out that this um, configuration is the best. But that hasn't stopped some car manufacturers from uh, attempting to reinvent their design, right? And whereas designs like this might turn a few heads, they all have made the crucial mistake. They've sacrificed the previous learnings from all of the, all of the past experience in order to stand, from the, stand out from the crowd. And some of them has, have literally tried to reinvent the wheel. So if you know that four wheels offers the best performance, 
don't sacrifice that just to stand out. The interesting thing about um, the car industry is that when driverless cars start becoming the norm, that's when we'll start to see a huge difference in that. Like once, you, once there is no steering wheel, once you don't need to look forward out of the car, that's when the design will start to evolve. So quick show of hands, how many people have seen a website that is laid out like this? Yeah, most people, I imagine. Uh, this was actually uh, designed by a friend of mine, Dave Ellis. Um, and when it, when, when it comes to designing for online, we can safely make certain design choices because we know things work well like this. So just the way we know uh, a circular wheel works best on cars, we know that a certain configuration in certain things in digital design work best too. So the counter argument for this is everything en ends up looking the same. You know, people don't want the exact same website as everyone else, but I feel like that's a little bit lazy. You know, one thing you shouldn't do is sacrifice uh, user experience in order just to stand out. But that doesn't stop some people. So a few years ago, the Washington Post published an article about uh, this uh, trend called brutalist design, right? So this um, takes its name from an architectural movement in the 70s. And this is a literal attempt to look uncomfortable or be intentionally difficult to use. And it goes against all the UX uh, best practices, disregards standardized reading patterns, um, and it just makes things a lot difficult for the user. Um, I had a client once who, um, he was after a recruitment website and he said, I don't have candidates, I have superstars. So I was like, okay. And so he says, when you hit the website, I want it to be completely black. And then just when you're about to leave, you see a little flicker of a little starlight in one of the corners and you have to chase this star around the site. And then when you catch, finally catch the star, that's when you gain entry to the website. I was like, okay, so you, you don't want any business whatsoever then. Like, that's not the way to do things. So trying to be different, and all it really is is attention seeking, right? It's like, look at me, but you're not making things easier. All this really does is add to the amount of investment, cognitive lift that a user has to, to experience in order to get the result they, work, they, they want. And all you're going to really up with, end up with is the Nokia 7280. So apologies if Nokia's in the room anywhere, but, you know, it's... it's Trying to stand out from the crowd like that is not the experience that you should aim for. The other danger you fall into is having all of this knowledge and knowing how to hijack the brain's natural reactions and instinctive um, ways that it works, but then using that to deceive or trick the user into doing something that they, they don't want to do. And these are called dark patterns. Most of, we, of you will have heard of these, but these are carefully crafted user experience elements that are built to intentionally misdirect and or confuse. There are loads of these and you, no doubt every single one of you will have experienced them in some shape or form at some point in the past, but I just wanted to take you through a couple of my favorites. So the first one is bait and switch. This is the most common one, right? This is where you're enticed in by the promise of something great, but when you get in and you read the small print, it's just a trick. Now, as much as free beer sounds fantastic, free Wi-Fi and great beer is not as good as that. The second one is misdirections. This is a, a, a screenshot from uh, Amazon.com. Um, using the techniques I, I touched upon earlier on, this, this is, use, this is um, diverting the user's attention to a particular point to get them to do something that you want them to do rather than getting or making it easier to do the thing that they want to do the most. So in this case, you might not even see that there's a, the, the continue button in the middle there in order to just continue and get on with the purchase. This is guiding them down a path that they necessarily might not want to go down. It doesn't have to be design, just visual design. The way sentences are formed and the way copy is written can be dark patterns too. So this is, if you would like us to no longer continue to stop not sending you special deals and offers every week, please indicate you're inclined to say yes by not, by not checking the box. So I've read this about five dozen times and I still don't know if I'm supposed to click this box or not. And again, if we go back to that sort of investment versus payoff uh, scale that we talked about earlier, I'm not willing to invest the amount of time and my, my brain power just to work out what the sentence means. So I'm much more likely just to leave it unclicked or click it, just to make a guess. Uh, and that's intentionally um, playing on that knowledge from the user experience design point of view. 
This one's a great one. So this is a, a, an Instagram ad. And you can see, I don't know if you can see it at the back, but there's, a, there's just a hair on the screen there. Now that's not actually on the screen, that's built into the design. So when readers are clicking through their Instagram patterns, they want to swipe the hair off the screen and they actually end up swiping through to this, the shoe shop of the advertiser, which is just complete craziness. I mean, I don't know how valuable um, it'd be for, for, for the advertiser there to um, get them through there, but that clearly is not what the user wants to do. It's, it's going against their own um, path. And this makes its way into the real world as well. So when you look at a sandwich like this, you think you're getting a particular size, but really, you know, you, you just end up coming away disappointed. At worst, you're going to lose the trust of your audience. At best, all you're going to do is piss people off, really. So tempting as it might be, it's not worth it in the long run. So you might be thinking, all of this sounds great, but where is the proof? Now, luckily, we've got reams of data at the New York Times to help us to inform uh, and guide what we do from a user experience point of view. So I'm just going to share a couple of stats around the projects that our studio puts out. So our studio at the minute um, is almost ready to put out our 500th, 500th piece of content. And this ranges from video to VR to AR to articles, pretty much anything you can think of. And like I said before, it's really, really important to follow the same quality and standards and tone that the, new, that the native content is. Now, it's a good and a bad thing that the New York Times puts out really, really good quality content. But then our job as a studio is to try and match those levels. So it's, it's not as, uh, sometimes it can be a bit of a, a double-edged sword. So a couple of the stats. Um, there is 526% more time spent on content that we create than the content that our advertisers give to us. So if you follow the learnings that uh, I've taken you through today, and obviously, like I said, they're, they're, they're a lot more uh, expanded in the long run, but you should see a lot, lot more result, or a lot better results um, following these kinds of uh, learnings from um, the presentation. The second one is that three quarters of our programs have dwell times that are above the benchmarks. So people are coming to the content, they're spending time with it, um, they're engaged with it, uh, and, and a vast majority of the stuff that we put out actually beats the industry levels. There is also 78% of our programs surpass, surpass the moat benchmark for scroll depth. So not only are we getting readers onto the page, we're getting people to experience the content, they're actually engaging with it all the way through. So we've got that attention and we're sustaining it as the user goes down. Um, so I'll just skip a, skip a couple of slides because we're uh, running out of time. But just to sum up, one thing that I always go into when we're talking to um, my team and, and the designers, our team's made up of developers, designers, editors, videographers, animators. Um, we always try and say to them, we want to try and create experiences that our readers lose their lunch hour to, right? So you might not even know that you want to um, consume all of this content or you don't know that your investment and payoff scale, where, where that lies, this is not a conscious decision. But in the end, we just want value for our readers value for the, the, the company itself, and value for the brands that um, advertise with us. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much.